Umar uh, again. Uh, Alhamdulillah, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed this to um, this recording to happen again. I will try not to interrupt Dr. Umar, um, but uh, but uh, you know when I'm talking to him, uh, and sometimes I get excited when he says something and something happens in my brain. I'm like, oh, I gotta ask this, and I don't want to lose the chain of thought. And um, really, the setup is such that like typing something is not uh, um, ideal for me here. Mm. Shall I'll try to make it as possible. Um, having said that, uh, Dr. Omar, I want to uh, actually let me actually start with uh, the concept of humanism that, uh, you know, there's this concept that uh, religion is bad because it creates problems. And humanism is good because that's how we will get along by accepting or overlooking our race, our creed, our religion. We're all equal and, be, and you know, this kind of like we're all equal, all, all citizens of the world um, versus, you know, religion causes division. Uh, this is something that in the academic circles, um, uh, you know, uh, is, is something that's there. And it's kind of like if you talk about, like, for example, if you're in the university and you talk about religion or use religion as a reference, you consider like you're you're still behind, you know, yes. uh, using religious yeah. language or religious ideas or even studying religion. Mm -hmm. And then the city setting is considered like, uh, you know, you're not that smart yet. Uh, you still mm -hmm. have catching. Um, so, yeah. Any thoughts on that? Oh, probably plenty. And. Uh too many <laughs> to fit into one small hour. The, the problem here is that of escapism, okay? And we can um, address that in terms of what people like to call freedom or liberty, mm -hmm. okay? Now, what humanists try to do is apologize for escaping from the limitations set on us all by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're trying to do away with those limits, okay? The, what the uh, Quran calls uh, Qadar, okay? The, the measure, okay? Right. There's a measurement that is given to all things in the universe and all things human, okay? So if we look at our our physical body, well, it's limited by the skin, okay? You, you, you really can't go beyond that skin. And if you do, then you're entering into realms that are above the mundane, above the normal, the, not supernatural, supranormal, okay? Above the normal. And once you get above the normal, you have lost your root, Okay, now this has everything to do with the the office of the prophet. Okay, and uh, let don't interrupt me here because I don't want to lose my train of thought here. I'm being sort of this is an outpouring. So if we go up own will, okay we are being disobedient, okay? Because Allah said, don't do that, don't go there, okay? Can you repeat if, that? Because the Skype uh, missed out a few words from what you just said. Oh my gosh, okay, yeah, this maybe this is not good. If we enter this realm, we go above the supranormal, we go above the normal into the supranormal, then we are being disobedient because Allah said, do not go there, mm -hmm. okay? And so, but man wants to, I'm saying this because man wants to break away from these limitations, yes. okay? So the humanist wants to do it abstractly, okay? Mm -hmm. The spiritualist wants to do it by going above the normal mm -hmm. and being disobedient, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, let me explain this in terms of the prophetic example, and then we'll go back to the humanist, okay? Mm -hmm. The prophetic example, uh, according to Al-Torat, and even according to the Quran, is that the individual seeking to have 
a more intimate relationship with Allah who is closer to him than his jugular vein, okay, simply waits, okay? He doesn't go anywhere. He doesn't try to enter the astral realm. He doesn't try to go above the normal. He doesn't enter the forbidden supranormal realms. He sits where he is within his limited skin and he waits for the angel to come. Okay. Now that waiting entails some, maybe entails some, some, some prayer, some fasting, whatever it is. Okay. And the prophetic, the prophet's example was this. I mean, every year he took this time and he went up to the cave and he sat and he meditated and his good wife, Khadija, always brought him what he needed for the day. Okay, this was the way it was. And this was the way it was with all the prophets, mm -hmm. even the best of the shamans from the native tribes. This is what they did. Mm -hmm. Okay, they would separate themselves apart from the community and they would go and sit in their skin mm -hmm. <laughs> and meditate and pray hoping to get a dream or a vision or some sort of communication that would be of benefit in a, in, in a way that would help guide them and their people, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, what happened is this. What always happens is this. When the individual is in that state, that earnest state of pure intent, okay, to obtain divine will, then as Allah dictates, as Allah wills, the angel comes mm -hmm. and the angel takes that person out of their mundane into the supernormal realm or realms, okay? Mm -hmm. All of these upper heavens that we, we don't know about, we know about, but we haven't experienced consciously. We have no memory of them. Okay, for the most part. So this is what happened with the Hijra. Um, the prophet was taken up and out. Okay, yes, okay. right. This yes. is this is what happens to all of the prophets. They're they're visited. They're taken up and out. The spiritualist, on the other hand, he wants to storm the heaven, just like the jinn. Okay, mm -hmm. he wants to go and take the uh, experience. He doesn't mm -hmm. wait for the angel. Okay? Mm -hmm. He does not wait for the supernormal messenger. He mm -hmm. does not wait for permission. He does not wait for the password. Mm -hmm. Okay, At each gate in the, in the heavenlies, there are angels and you have to have a password to get through the gate. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right? This is very clear. The Islamic and before I read these things in the Quran and in the various commentaries, it was already clear in Al Torah. You mm -hmm. see, it's the same pattern. Allah does not change the pattern. He may change some of the language. He may change some of the dressing. He, the angels may even appear differently according to whatever the customs are, but. When they come, they they come, usually they look like men, okay? And uh, they not only visit the men, but they also visit the women, mm -hmm. okay? There are some prophetesses in al -Turat. One of them is named uh, Deborah, okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they're not all men. But I'm saying this so that we can come back to humanism with a better, proper perspective, okay? Mm -hmm. Because this is what the magicians do. The magicians go, they enter the realms without permission. Now, what happens with the magician is this, you see. The magician is given a delusion. So Allah has given Iblis permission to delude the magician. So the magician is taken into a world that appears to be like the heavenlies, but it is not, mm. okay? It's all a vain imagination. But he comes back thinking that he's actually been there, okay? Mm. Uh, and then he speaks and he's earnest and his disciples follow him. And, uh, you know, Sufis have done this. Pseudo-Sufis mm. have done this, okay? Mm. 
they've actually gone into these realms and they believe that they've, you know, had discussions with the prophet, had discussions with so and so and so and so. And all the time they're being fooled by jinn. Jinn yeah, are this the. It's very important because um, a lot of Muslims pay attention to that type of yes. conversation more yes. than the, spir- the, the scriptures, right? Yes, more than the scriptures, you see. And because they do not read, you see, last time we spoke, I said, I know because I read, you mm. see. I'm obedient to Jibreel, I read. Mm. And these Muslims do not read, they don't. They just sit. They do their decay, they and they become involved in the superstitious realm, okay? And then Satan has them by the throat. Mm-hmm. He has them, okay? And so I'm saying all of that so we can come back to humanism with the proper uh, perspective because that spiritualism, that anti-prophetic stream is also a form of escapism. Mm. Okay. Uh, Allah said, don't do it. Yeah, don't do it. If I want to talk to you, I will talk to you. And I will talk to whoever, whoever I choose, not whoever you choose. Mm. <laughs> There's a big difference, you see. Now, the humanists are trying to get away from all of this. Why? Yeah, because of all the superstitious nonsense going on. Anyone who reads, who's a humanist, but who has embraced the concepts that uh, we find in atheism, in other words, they're going away from God, if they look at the superstitious realm, and Muslims are a perfect example of this, Look at how the superstition has destroyed them. Wherever you find superstition and the practice of magic, you find ignorance and poverty, Mm -hmm. helplessness, okay? Mm -hmm. It's rampant in the Muslim nation. These curses go together. And all of this is in Al-Turat. It's probably in the Quran too, but written differently, said differently, okay? Mm -hmm. So the humanist looks at this superstitious nonsense the epitome of which is the Catholic Church, okay? Not just, look, you know, you have this wonderful uh, uh, Vatican experience and the churches are all beautiful, but the people, the masses of the Catholic people are in poverty and most of them are superstitious. Mm. Okay. Mm. Oh, don't do that. Saint so-and-so lived there, da-da-da. And they're all worshiping these dead bodies and lighting candles to them and all this stupid nonsense. They're grave worshippers just like Muslims have become grave worshippers. Okay. Mm. So they're praying to the saints instead of praying to God. And the humanist looks at all of this stupid religious nonsense, all of this superstition, and says, No, I don't want any part of that. Mm. You see? And the educational system has become so distant from God since the Enlightenment. And the Catholic education, educational system has become so distant from the relevance, okay, that we have in the relationship with God that the people don't want any part of this. They either don't want any part of it or they embrace it and apologize for it in the Jesuit uh, sense. And then if you become the Jesuit uh, student, you then become another form of uh, idolater, okay? Mm -hmm. And you're an idolater who's embracing humanism at the same time. And how can I say that? Oh, because you see, uh, at that realm of their level of spiritual understanding, you see, they have entered what the realm of the deist. Mm -hmm. And the realm of the deist is actually an old Hindu form of monism. And they say, just like the founders of the American Constitution say, yes, we believe in God, but God is so far distant. He's so unconcerned with our business here on earth. He left us in charge. We're Mm -hmm. the boss. We're the new gods. And so this is why you have 
for example, George Washington on the top of the Capitol Dome painted in his theophonic state. They mm -hmm. made him into a new Christ, sitting mm -hmm. there with the angels, you know, looking down upon the Capitol and everything that's taking place there. This is all paganism. Mm -hmm. And the Jesuits apologize for it with this deistic nonsense. And uh, they say, okay, well, you know, God's so far away, we have to pray to Mary because she's intermediate, you see, so they're Mariolatrists, but they don't like to emphasize that too much. Let's not discuss that. Let's just bow our heads in prayer, you see. Mm -hmm. And when you have this attitude, what happens is that you go to these uh, uh, these political rallies where you're You've got the Jesuits in, in position. They're all up there, you see. Right. Look, this 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 fellow now, this um, Fauci, he's a Jesuit. Okay. Mm. All of those people who are now performing this hoax on the world, they're under the thumb of the Jesuits, mm. and they will profess humanism, but they will still bow and have a moment of silence. Mm. You see. You go into a stadium, and what happens? Oh, there's this moment of silence. Where right. does this thing come from? This thing comes from the synagogue. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a synagogue ritual, this moment of silence. And now it's all over the world, a moment of silence. How did it get there? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> well, the, human, the humanists brought it. They brought us their football games. They brought us their, their uh, baseball games. They brought us all these wonderful things. They brought us the flag. They brought us the, the salute to the flag. They brought us all these things. And they said, look, we're in charge because God left us in charge. Mm. Okay. Since, uh, since the revolution that took place with the, with the French, I with the Jesuit thumb, this French Revolution. All of this is transcended. The old re regime has been taken away. And now we have all these democratic republics. You even have communist uh, nations calling themselves democratic republics. You see? Yeah. <laughs> and everybody has the idea that their vote counts. When in fact, look, I'll just put it to you this way. I'm an informed individual. OK, I've been informing myself for the better part of 70 years now, mm -hmm. and my vote is not equal to the vote of an alcoholic on the back street. Mm -hmm. They're not equal. OK, mm -hmm. so let's get away from that idea. But they have equalized everybody and everybody's following this delusion. Dr. Muhammad Just, Iqbal in his poetry, he says uh, they count the vote. They don't weigh it. Yes, they don't weigh them. Exactly. They don't weigh the vote, they count the vote. They count the vote. And, and Stalin said, <laughs> who votes? It matters who counts the vote. <laughs> that's, what, uh, that's what really amount matters, you see. And so <coughs> we have all of this, uh, this, this big mismatch is there. All of this leveling his all these people, believers and non-believers and humanists and atheists and Satanists, are all saluting to the flag, and they go to the football game, and everybody has this moment of silence. Mm -hmm. you see. Yeah, it's a truth. Everybody. Yeah, in the Olympics and games everywhere. Uh, well, this is a religious moment. It's a religious moment. Okay? And in that moment, is God being honored? <laughs> not by a long shot, not by a long shot. And this is what people don't understand. And this is also what humanists don't understand. It's a form of escapism. Everyone's trying to run away from God. Even those who say they're trying to get near to him. Mm. They're all running away from God. They're all running away from the limitations. Mm. Okay, so I brought that full circle. Now let's discuss humanist, and I'll try to do this from a uh, scriptural perspective that is that explains the archetype, okay, and in terms that will get us take us back to the circle. 
Uh, I can I'm in the zone. Okay, I can feel it now. I'm in the zone. What they call <laughs> um, uh, the what happened is this. Uh, let's go back to Adam and his good wife, and maybe not so good wife and not so good Adam. They were at one time. Okay, they were innocent and pure, just like the child. And these archetypes are true, they're real, they're mythical, they're also scriptural, they have their spiritual reality and their physical reality and their psychological reality, okay? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can look back at that story, it has many, many layers. It's endless, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. Before they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they maintained their purity. You see, this purity was there. It has nothing to do with sexuality. Just throw that out the window. The sexuality was already there. The sensuousness was already there. The apple has nothing to do with Adam partaking of Eve. All right, mm. forget about that. That's a false track that uh, that Eve was, that Eve was threw in. Okay, the apple has everything. Uh, to do with eating the from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil okay so when adam did that he then had knowledge of evil you see before that he didn't have this knowledge of evil so before that he could not have sinned you mm. see it wasn't in him to sin he wasn't like this curious child who just wanted to go and experience uh, this limited world and see whether or not the stove is really hot. Mm. He, this was not Adam. Adam was an obedient son. He was tempted and he was tempted by the first creature to sin that we know about. And mm. that was an emissary of Eblis himself. It may or may not have been Eblis. We don't really know. Some people think it was his wife. Um, and uh, in the form of this, what they call the serpent or the shining one, the serpent. Uh, it's not really a serpent because we, it's, it's a shining one, a shining being, a shining creature, okay? Uh, so Adam was uh, tempted, he fell. Now I'm saying this about Adam because I want to compare him with Kabil, with his son, okay? Okay. You see, Adam, uh, and all of this is leading to humanism. So just bear with me. Adam sinned. And when he realized what the consequences were, uh, he tried to run from, from God, right? He, he, he saw immediately. He was naked. This has nothing to do with sexuality. This has everything to do with the loss of God's guidance, the loss of God's presence, the loss of God's protection. Mm. Okay, so that's what the story is about. That's what nakedness means. Okay, so when Adam saw this, he hid. And then, but God, in His mercy, pursued him, found him out. Then Adam repented. You see, he he repented, and the situation was changed. The conditions were changed not by virtue of what Allah had done, or Allah had foreseen this. He knew this was going to happen. It doesn't mean he determined that it was going to happen. Adam determined it. Determined it. Iblis determined it, okay? They're free-willed individuals, they are, but we're all in a system that is limited. Mm -hmm. So if you do these things, if you collapse, collaborate with the enemies of obedience to Allah Subhana, consequences occur mm. and they cannot be avoided. Mm. Okay. Now, you may not know about these consequences, but when they happen, then you know about them. You find out what happened to Adam. Okay. Iblis already knew. He already knew. So, Adam knew, but what did Adam do? He repented. Conditions were changed. Allah, in his mercy, adjusted his grace to those conditions. And then Adam and his children had to proceed.
proceed uh, in this new realm with the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, innocent. Okay, now the humanists will look at that story and say, it's, "Oh, no, that's just all nonsense. Mm. All bloody nonsense." Okay, it's just a fairy tale. Okay, well, be that as it may. What happened then is there was a period of time. We don't know how much time, whether it was thousands or millions of years. We don't know what these ages were. No, this is hidden from us. Suddenly, Kabil comes along and he kills his brother. He kills his brother in a, uh, in, in a religious fury. Okay. What happened? Well, Abel, his brother, Kabir, um, uh, what's his the Arab name? I can't remember. Abel, uh, Cain's brother, uh, mm -hmm. gave the best of his work as a 10% or what you would call a tithe to Allah Subhanahu as an offering. Mm -hmm. He took from his uh, flocks the very best. Okay. He didn't just give away uh, something that he was no longer using. He went to Saks Fifth Avenue and he bought the best coat and he gave that away to his neighbor. Okay. <laughs> in, in, I'm just using that as an example. Sure. He gave the best. He gave the best uh, away, not something he was no longer going to use. That's a useless form of charity. Okay. Mm. There's no benefit in that. Okay. Uh, it, that, that benefit is only immediate. Okay, it doesn't, go, it's not eternal. But when you give your best, this is eternal, you see. This speaks to Allah Subhanahu because the best belongs to him, mm. you see. And when you give your best, you become the best. Mm. Okay. Now, Kabil did not give his best. He, gave, he kept the best for himself. <laughs> this is what kings do, is it not? Of course yeah. it is. Yeah. This is what kings do. This is what the Saudis do. This is what the Iranian kings do. This led to their corruption. The Ottomans were the same. They're all the same. Mm. Okay? They keep the best for themselves. They do not give it to Allah. They do not give the best to their brothers and their sisters. Mm. Okay? They mm. don't do it. And they completely ignore those who are not Muslim. Mm. As a matter of fact, they kill them, they murder them, and they justify it according to their own law. Mm. And this is what Kabil did. Mm. Okay. So he was the first king of the pirates. <laughs> mm. so think of it that way. Yeah. After you see, uh, I hope I made that clear because yeah, no, he did, very clear, very clear. You see, Kabir did not repent. Allah gave him the chance to repent, and he did not repent. Mm -hmm. He refused, and then Allah cursed him. Yes, he did. And if you read in the Genesis account, the curse was very severe. Allah said, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I'm not going to answer your prayers. The earth will not produce for you anymore. You can till it. It will be dead to you. It will be dead to your hand. And your brother's going to, or everyone's going to hate you. You see? And then Kabil said, oh, 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 my God. Oh, my, this is too much for me to bear. Mm. And then he didn't, he didn't think even then to repent. He only thought about preserving his earthly life. Mm. He, said, he said, if men see me, they will want to kill me. Mm. And then Allah subhanahu in his wisdom said, no, they won't. I'm going to mark you. And men will fear to kill you. Okay. So Cain became the first pirate. And that's what we're confronted with right now. We're confronted with the fulfillment of this iniquity of the Amorite. Mm. 
which mm. I mentioned the other day. Yes, yes, I remember, yes. Okay, so now this is coming to its fulfillment. The iniquity of the Amorite is now coming to its fulfillment, mm -hmm. okay? Now, how does this relate to humanism? Well, the humanist looks at all of this that's taking place, and they say, oh, this is all utter nonsense. It's all rubbish, and um, we're just not going to deal with it. We're going to ignore it. We're going to find our own way. Mm. Well, that's an element of what Kabil had to do. He had to find his own way. Right. You see? Because God was no longer going to speak with him. Mm. Kabil uh, could do all the prayer that he wanted. It didn't matter because he refused to repent. So mm. what did Kabil have to do? Men are religious by nature. It is in us. Right. And just because just because Allah cursed Kabir does not mean he took away this religious desire. It's still there. Mm. So if you don't serve Allah, there's only one other prince to serve. There's only one other king. Oh. You either you see, you, so that he all he had to turn to Iblis. And Iblis had already tempted him anyway, mm -hmm. and this was part of the curse. What Allah said, and I'm going to say it almost literally uh, as it's written, Allah said, if you do not repent, there stands sin at the door, mm -hmm. and you will rule over him. Mm -hmm. He did not say sin will rule over you. Mm -hmm. He said you will rule over sin. Mm. Sin was the ancient uh, name of a god mm. in the Hindu valley amongst the Druid people. That god was then imported to Haran, to the city of Ur, where Ibrahim rebelled okay, mm. against this system. Okay, So that system, and you know what that sin is represented by? It's represented by the lunar disk. Oh, now this lunar disk sits atop every mosque. Yes. Okay? And in the center of that disk is the star for his wife. Mm. Okay. Are you, you getting now yes, what's yes. happened, Yuma? Yes. So this, Allah said, you will rule over sin. <laughs> so, so. Uh, the Kabir, the those who have inherited the religion of Kabir, because Kabir had to have a religion, they are now stamping the world with his sigils. Everywhere you go, you see the mark of Cain. It's there, and it's all in these uh, these sigils that are used by the corporates or used by the religious leaders. Yeah, this, uh, this, this mark of the the moon and the star became. Uh, prominent during the Ottomans. Yes, it did. They brought it in. They brought it into use. It was the Ottomans who brought it in. This is a satanic symbol. It's a, it's a symbol that has to do with ancient human sacrifice, you see? And I'll try to explain this to you so that your listeners will understand. What Cain did, what Kabil did in the ancient Hindu valley, in the pre-Dravidian pre and Dravidian cultures, was he was the first to civilize them. You see, the, the life of a pirate becomes old after a while. All this killing and hacking away, you know, to get your uh, rice in your bowl for the day and to, you know, get the woman that you want. That's tiresome. There's got to be a better way to do it. So Iblis taught him a different system. You organize this religion, you create this goddess, people worship her, and then the goddess has to do, demands a human sacrifice to be propitiated so that she grants uh, a favor to the land, da, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And then the people live in fear because they don't know who's going to be next on the altar. Mm. You see? And so uh, people then bow to the, uh, the goddess and they bow to her 
I preached, who also happens to be her husband. And there they who then developed sons of God and daughters of God at the top of the temple steps. And, you know, every once in a while when things go bad, we have another human sacrifice and, and then things get better because the seasons change and oh God, you know, the sun has returned and you know, spring has come and the growing oh, okay, all of the, all of this nonsense. Okay. All of this nonsense. Cain established, put this into a religion. These religions became the mystery religions of the ancient world. The mystery religion of the ancient world uh, was perfected in both Egypt and also in uh, uh, Babylon. And these systems then moved westward. They moved into the Ottoman Empire. What became the Ottoman Empire, they then moved into Rome. They are now incorporated as part of the Catholic rituals, part of many of the Christian rituals. And Muslims have done pretty much the same thing because the pseudo-Sufi cults, I'm not talking about the real Sufis. You have real Sufis like uh, Muhammad Mukhtar, uh, Omar Mukhtar, who I took my name from him, you see. That was a real Sufi. Right. Okay. That's a guy who got up from, from the prayer book, uh, from from teaching the children how to do their mathematics. Okay, and then he put, he put his, he loaded his uh, his 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 carbine. <laughs> he loaded his revolver, picked up his sword, and then at seventy years old, jumped on a horse and went to war. Mm. Now this is my kind of Sufi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't don't give me these bead counting no gooders to just sit there and your wife because they're too holy. I don't want to talk to these men. They don't belong at my campfire. Okay, mm -hmm. they're not worthy. Okay, but give me a man like Omar Mukhtar. Okay. Anyway, your pseudo Sufis were in Turkey. Most of them, they were in Persia. They were mixed up with the ancient Medes, the ancient uh, Jews who were thrown out of uh, Israel because of their sins, because they had accepted the religion of Cain instead of the book that, just like the Quran says, they threw it away. And Isa said, look, you, you do one thing, <laughs> but you teach, the, you teach the people another. Hypocrites. <laughs> OK, this is what happened. So uh, the the thing of it is that the humans say, look at all of this. And they say, no, we, we don't want any part of it. So we're going to create our own system. And what is their system? Well, their system is still that of Cain. Cain is the man who's going to rule over sin. Well, that makes him God. <laughs> Yeah, you know, just, he becomes his own God. You, it occurred to me for the first time while I was just listening to you that when shaitan has or when iblis has people worshiping the idols <clears throat> right? like okay so like yes. this this guy this jinn rebels against god and says okay i don't want to bow down to adam but then why does he go to the extent of creating or getting man to bow down to another idol is because <laughs> he wants to compete with god he wants to create another world well um, it's, wor it's worse than that he wants to shame men right he right. wants to shame men, and that's what they're do doing. That's why you hear uh, 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 Sheikh um, uh, Imran Hussein. He's always using this word shameful, 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 because that's what it is. Mm. Iblis is causing men to do shameful things. And bowing down to an idol is the most shameful of all these sins. Mm. <laughs> That's why Iblis does it, not because he wants to be worshipped, not that uh, he doesn't have his own pride. Of course, he has his own pride, but he, he, he has his own angels to his worship him, to obey make, him. Yeah. <coughs> Say again. I said his agenda is to make man shameful. Yes, his, his, his agenda is to shame man permanently. Mm. Okay? And the end result is to take them to hell because he knows that's where he's going. So he'll have plenty of company, you see, and he wants this human company because it's the only thing that's going to give him any pleasure in hell is to see how many men he's drugged there. OK, right. mm -hmm. uh, so, they, 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 you know, there's no other pleasure. 
So the humanist looks at all of this and they say, I'm not going to accept this religion. They're all a bunch of nonsense. And then he creates his own religion. I'm God. I'm the judge. I'm going to decide what's good and what's bad. Me, 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 me. Well, again, that brings us back to Kabil, mm. keeping the best for himself. <laughs> okay, so I hope that uh, gives you an idea of the the archetype. Uh, yes. We could go in. We we can go into all of the intellectual discourse about humanism, this humanism, that postmodernism, da da da. That's all futile discourse. Because it's all part of the system of idolatry, and that system of idolatry, as far as the humanist is concerned, is self-idolatry. Mm. The worst thing you can do is to make yourself your own god. Mm. <laughs> and that's what they're doing, you mm. see. And so to do that, they have to create an entire universe of a discourse that's going to apologize for it. Mm. And in so doing... They think that they're escaping the limitations, mm. which is where I brought us. Right, okay. right. That's, that's like your punchline. The main point today is yes. that uh, humanism is an attempt to uh, either, uh, you know, overlook intellectually, conceptually. Yeah. And another word you used that's very important is that you said in the abstract world they're doing this, right? Because practically yes. the results yes. are totally horrendous. Yes. Uh, but they feed you this fantasy in the, in the, in the intellectual world. Yes. And, and they want to cross the limits set by Allah and they want their freedoms and all of that. And, yes. uh, uh, but in the end, you, you can't escape that, you know? No. And, and There's I think no another escape. really fascinating point you made is that, um, uh, that man has religious sentiments regardless of where he is on the scale. And so yes. if you, if he doesn't, <clears throat> with a true religion or even with a false religion, he'll do it in the superstitious world. Yes. And uh, uh, another very important point I think that you raised was about pseudo-Sufis. Because I think uh, when Muslims don't, are not especially cognizant of the Quran specifically, and uh, they want to get close to Allah, uh, a lot of the pseudo-Sufis then might have experiences that are actually tricking them. Yes. And uh, then they pay attention to these experiences and try to go, like you said, without getting permission, trying to get into the heavens, yes. getting these experiences. Yes. Uh, and um, and and that can be that can be um, uh, a, a big deception. And it, it has is a deception. Yeah. It's a great deception. OK. And this is this is the deception. It's the same deception that has led to the stream of uh, what's his name uh, this fellow named Schwann and uh, these perennialists okay uh, the, 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 these people are preaching something that has some uh, reputation in the ancient universal universalism mm. but it has descended because it has it, it, it has become corrupt because mm -hmm. of this practice, this practice of meditation, uh, this Hinduism, this practice of meditation and breaking into the supernormal, mm -hmm. which is forbidden. OK, it's forbidden. You don't you don't do that. And but that's what they do. And then they say, oh, well, all over the world, we find evidence for this, 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 this. this and all of that is true. Mm -hmm. But it is not. It is not in keeping with the prophetic example. Mm. Uh, an example of this is, for, for example, if we look at, the, at the, the Germanic myths, we come to a fellow named Odin. Now, Odin uh, was, in, in my estimation, from what I've read, uh, what little we know about this individual, he was their prophet way back when, in a period where nobody remembers. We have no living memory of it. But what happens to the prophetic stream that's brought to any people, it is, it is that it is perverted, it is corrupted. Mm -hmm. And it's always corrupted by idolatry. Isa makes this very clear in the Gospel of Barnabas. It's mm -hmm. always corrupted by idolatry. They take the prophet, they turn him into a hero, 
They then create statues, and then they then create uh, certain holidays, da 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 da, like the um, the Fatimids created the, the 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 birthday celebration for the Prophet. You see, and if you don't partake, that means you're not a real Muslim, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is political manipulation. It's it, it is psychological manipulation. It's power seeking. And that's what idolatry is. They, mm -hmm. uh, the idolatry wants to have power over the regional uh, congregation. That's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And they get that power so that they can take the best and, like all kings, keep it for themselves. Right. So it brings us back to Kabir each and every time. So that, my dear brother, is my gift to you and your listeners today from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this archetype. Right. This archetype. Very important. I, I, I think you can walk away with that and have a greater understanding for what is taking place when you look into the world and see who is taking what and keeping it for themselves. Hmm. See? Right. Okay, thank you oh. so much. Jazakumullah khairan, inshallah. Until next time. Until next time, wassalamu alaikum.